all said that when I got up here, the choir was leaving. I'm just glad you didn't too. A lot of things going on. I want to make you aware of them before we get going today. Um, have you signed up for your picture taken, being taken yet? We're redoing the pictorial directory. And so we would like your picture in there, and that way we'll all know who you are. And if we don't, we can look up the picture and find out who you are and maybe give you a call. So be sure to sign up out in the foyer online, that sort of thing. I do apologize for the robocall you got from me. I don't like those things, but um, it was the most efficient way to call all of you, personally, sort of. Uh, we do want to mention that on Friday night this week at 7 o'clock, the Southwest Church Connection will be in town. The president of the organization will be here presenting what the Southwest CC is about and all the events and stuff that's been going on this last year. It's what they call their traveling business meeting. Rather than everybody in the uh, Southwest CC to get together at one time, they come to us. So it's a wonderful opportunity and they provide the pie. So come and get free pie on Friday night. Additionally, in February, we are going to have a missions conference, only it's not a missions conference. It's called Living Out Loud. Um, and Arnie Humble's son, Kevin, is going to be the main presenter at that time. And he'll look in your bulletin and he'll list the dates and that sort of thing. We want you all to be involved in it. Uh, how to live out loud for Jesus as we try to reach the world. And let's see, anything else I have forgotten? Oh, yeah, I, I do have some dear friends who are with us. They've been with us a while. If you're a guest with us, you're special, but these are special, special. Okay. Uh, what's your name, Skip? Oh, Skip and Buzzy are with us. Uh, they, they are dear friends of mine, long-time ministry with the Navigators. If you were here last weekend, they spoke and had a wonderful ministry with us. Be sure to greet Skip and Buzzy Gray. Okay? Well, let's spend some time in the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, the opportunity to worship you. Let your Spirit speak to our hearts directly as we look into your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're taking a look at Jesus. Why? So that we can fall in love with him all over again. That's our heart, our passion, as we look in the book of John for examples of who he is and what he's done and is doing for us. Today we're in John chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Let's read this passage together in respect for God's word. Let's stand. Together. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew in. But Jesus answered them, saying, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You know, this passage that's before us, it, it, it's really one of my favorites that I use at funerals. Uh, it, it talks about unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, and how that even in our death when we are in Christ, it's not the end, it's the beginning of eternal life 
Though it may be the end of our physical life, it's just the beginning for those things in, in spirit. But this passage is not talking about us first. It's actually talking about Jesus. And Jesus is about to die. The events that we are discussing all occur in the last days of Jesus' life on earth. In the context of John 12, we, we have Mary washing the feet of Jesus, filling the room with the aroma, weeping over his feet. And Jesus saying, leave her alone. She's preparing me for my funeral. And then he enters Jerusalem, and he doesn't sneak in in. He comes in full-blown, doesn't he? Now, he doesn't come in riding on a horse, does he? No, he comes riding on a donkey, not showing himself to be the great conqueror, but, but actually the man of peace. And, and as he's coming, what do the people do? They take down palm branches, and they lay it on the sides, and they proclaim, hallelujah, hallelujah, hosanna, hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're excited. Why are they excited? Because they're announcing this is Messiah. This is the King of Israel. He comes into the worst fears of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What's he going to do now? And the crowds proclaim. And what does he immediately do? He goes into the temple. He cleanses the temple for the second time. And as it's being cleansed, you know what happens. It rises the ire of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests. But in all of this, he is not doing it in secret. You, you know, before this happened, he'd come in and... I, I'm not saying he snuck into Ju Jerusalem. That's not what I'm saying. But, but any time people began to proclaim, You are the Christ! You are the Christ! And what would happen? Hush. Be silent. But he doesn't do that this time. He welcomes it. He embraces it. He endorses the fact that he is the Messiah. The coming King. He's the fulfillment of all prophecies relating to it. Among those that are there is the crowd that had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And they saw what was going on. And so we have various people's groups in here. But understand, in the context of what he is doing and saying, he did not come for Israel alone. He came for the world. He came for the world. This is a notice to the whole world. Uh, I sometimes wonder why this passage is included in Scripture. B but, but let me speculate. John 3, 16. For God so loved the... And Jesus comes in in this huge parade... Nothing compared to the Roman victory parades. But I mean, it's huge for the day and the time. And who's the first people it mentions after this? Greeks. Oh, you know what Jesus is proclaiming? And you know what I think John is trying to show? That Jesus is not just the Messiah for Israel. But the Messiah for the entire world. Isn't that interesting? Let's look at the text and some of the things that we can garner from it today. First, this issue of the Greeks. There was interest in Jesus on the part of the Greeks. Who are these people? Well, I don't think they're Jewish proselytes. But in other words, they hadn't become Jews they, because it calls them Greeks. Now, the Greeks were allowed into the temple area. Matter of fact, they had a courtyard for them, the courtyard of the Gentiles. So Gentiles could come. They couldn't go into the 
inner parts. You understand, because they weren't Jews. But the Greeks could go in there. And, and so at this wondrous festival of Passover, here are these Greeks. Maybe they were monotheistic. That means only one God. And they believed that there was one God, the God of the Jews. Maybe they, they were searching out the law. The only thing is that while they were there in Jerusalem, they see the hustle, the bustle, and they come to Philip. Why did they come to Philip? Oh, Philip was from Bethsaida. Do you know anything about Bethsaida? Uh, this area was heavily populated with Gentiles. It was almost totally uh, integrated with the Gentiles. So they come to Philip. What do you know by, about Philip? I'm going to ask Skip Gray this because guess what his name is? Philip. All right. Right, Skipper? Yeah, I know that. So Philip is a Greek name. So why did they come to Philip? Because he had a Greek name and he was associated with the Greeks. He knew all about it. And so Philip listens. He takes them to who? Andrew. Andrew. Jeff Field will say, the bringer. The bringer. And, and so they, what do they do? They come to Jesus. And what do they say? They say, sir, we would see Jesus. Man. Is that the passion of our heart? Oh, that we would see Jesus. I've seen so many pulpits, and on the, the front it says, we would see Jesus. And, and that should be the, the outline. It should be the purpose of every sermon ever given. And I just saw Dick and Candy here. I don't know who those guys are, but I think they were here about nine years Something like that, right? Do y'all know Dick and Candy? Stand up. Do y'all remember them? Good to have them back. You think I don't recognize people when I'm speaking. No, I know where every one of you sits. Good to see you, Dick. Good to see you, Candy. Um, now I forgot where I was. Oh, was I preaching? Oh, I was preaching. I, I forgot about that. Um, the Greeks, you know, heavy residents associated with Bethsaida, and they approached him, and they would see Jesus. Oh, that we would see Jesus. We would have that same passion. You, you know what the implications of all this is? There are so many implications. One, Jesus came to be the Savior for the world. Did he actually see these guys? It doesn't say. I don't know. Um, did they get to talk with him? I don't know. It doesn't say. All we have is Jesus' response following all this. But it does give me an indication and implies what my responsibility is. If Jesus came for the world, what is my responsibility in sharing the gospel? It's for the world. Jesus loved the world. We need to love the world. Jesus was reaching out to all the world, and we should be doing it as well. Every one of us taking the responsibility upon us to reach us the furthest corners of the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ because that's what he comes that's why he came and whether it's to the north or south or downtown or out in the country our responsibility is to reach the world for Jesus because Jesus is Messiah not just for the Jews but for the whole world it's interesting Jesus' response Jesus says, the hour has come. If you remember reading through the Gospels, 
this phrase is always used in the negative, except here. Uh, that is, my hour has not yet come. Do you remember in John chapter 2, the wedding at Cana, turning the water into wine, Mary saying, Jesus, and Jesus responds to it, woman, my hour has not yet come. But now he says, it's here. It's now. This is the hour I came for. This is it. I'm sure the disciples were amazed by his reaction. You know, all of a sudden, instead of pushing off all the accolade around, he embraces it. He embraces the accolade. And, and so we see Jesus responding. And, and it's amazing to me that here he's gone through this triumphal entry with all this hoopla and all the stuff going on. And yet, where is the focus of his tension? Not in the hoopla, but in these Greeks that have come. And it's when they are mentioned, that's when the fullness of the hour is done. It's ready. He's ready to what? To be a seed that dies. To be a seed that dies. He, he states that, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, who is he talking about? You know, he's talking about himself. What is about to occur? He is about to be crucified. And, he, and the normal reaction with the death of a person is extreme sorrow. And he's saying, no, this is just the start. Because if the seed dies, then there's going to be a whole bunch of fruit. Now, anybody in here ever planted a seed? Now, you put it in the ground, you cover it up, and then you dig it up every day to see if it's growing, right? You, you know what that seed has to do? It has to die. But once it dies, what happens? It takes root, it grows, it becomes a stalk of corn, a stalk of wheat, you know, whatever, you know, it happens to be. But for it to produce the maximum yield, it first has to die. That's a principle that's hard for us to grasp. You, you know, it's almost like he's saying to these Greeks, I've got to die first before you can be saved. Of course, he had to say that to Israel as well. I've got to die, and if I die, I'll bring forth much fruit. The interesting thing is, I believe this is what Jesus demands of us. To be like him. We need to die. I am not promoting suicide or murder. That is not what I'm talking about. Jesus says, to bear fruit, you have to die first. What, what does that mean then? What does it mean? I, I really think it means dying to self. For us, it means we continue to live, but who has to die? The old man, the old nature, the self-centeredness that we tend to be so focused on today, a moving away from me to him and focusing more and more on him, being more concerned. It's a process. I found that I don't die to all of me at one time. I die a piece at a time. And we all have to die. And the easiest way to do it from a spiritual standpoint is one piece at a time. Understand, this is not bleak. This is not dark. I'm not talking morbidity here. 
I, I'm talking about life. Because you die, what do you get? Something good out of it. The joy, the peace, the fruitfulness. Because if we want to hang on to this life, you've got to give it up. And if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. Oh, yeah, that's Matthew 16, 25. And what we have to do is find out what true living is all about. Giving up of ourself. What does it look like? Boy, this is hard. Dying to self. Could I give you some examples? Dying to self means stop giving unsolicited advice because you're always right and you know the answers. <laughs> Skip often says when we're raising our children, our children or adults, don't give any advice unless they ask for it. Well, what are we prone to do in so many situations? <laughs> Somebody shares something, and rather than empathizing with them and loving them, we're quick to tell them their faults and all that's wrong with them, and here's how you get out of it. Uh, that's saying, I've got the answer. I know everything. Evelyn Underhill <laughs> describes this entire process something like this. She says, we mostly spend our lives conjugating three verbs, to want, to have, and to do. Craving, clutching, and fussing, we are kept in perpetual unrest. Quite simply, when we die to self, we are no longer obsessed with me. Instead, we look to others. We look to Jesus in being consumed with him. What's the next step? How do we begin this dying process? I recommend, this is just rushing, you start small. Give up something. Give up something. I mean, give up that new cell phone when your old cell phone's still working. You don't need the latest. Give up. Go into Starbucks every day and give that money to someone that has a genuine need for food, clothing. Give up chocolate. No, that's, that's going too far. <laughs> it's way too far. Can't do that. Do you see what I'm saying? Start small, but give up. And then each day, give up something else. And... And see what it, it's like to live for others instead of ourselves. And see what God does in our lives. Additionally, we need to hate life. Ooh. What does loving our lives look like? If we're to hate our life, what does it mean to love our lives? Loving your life in this world means living with this life in view. You know, what is it? It's living for the best, the, the thing that gives me joy, happiness, you know, th those sort of things. You know, that's what living with this life in view is all about. But is that really what life is? Having the best car, the best house, the most money, the biggest reputation. You look at, at people in the Bible. You look at Paul. Uh, I guess he lived the good life. Woo! Did he? I mean, he was beaten thrice by rods in the sea. Uh, and the list goes on and on. Stone. Living the good life. How about John the Baptist? 
He had an exquisite wardrobe to be envied by all. And his diet would make Andrew Zimmern proud if you ever see Bizarre Foods. Did he live the good life? My answer is yes, they did. They lived the best life. There are only two things in life that last forever. You've heard me say that about 500 times. The Word of God and the souls of men. Everything else is going to do what? It fades. It's gone. So if you're living for this life, you're living for the pleasures of the here, the now. Where's the good life for the martyrs who are beheaded, sawn asunder, stone thrown in pits, rejected? They lived a good life before the eyes of the Lord. You've heard the motto, he who dies with the most toys wins. I want to tell you that's not true. Because they have nothing. Loving your life in this world means living for the same things people in the world live for. That's what living in this life. What, what do the people in, in the world live for? Three things. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world nor the things of the world. For all that is of the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what the world lives for. Do Christians have a propensity and tendency to do the same things? Of course. We're human. It's part of us. Greed, uh, accumulating worldly stuff, it is a temptation for all of us. We all struggle with it. Uh, we, we struggle with the world motto that to be happy, we have to have whatever. The stuff of the world. And all it is, is stuff. Your car is just stuff. Your house is just stuff. And your house is filled with stuff. <laughs> you got it. You know what's going to happen to all this stuff? Peter tells us. It's going to burn. And it's all going to pass away in a fervent heat. So all you're doing with this stuff is stockpiling for a fire. And that's what the mentality we have to understand. We are to love the Father, the Son. We're to love each other. And not worry about stuff. Because it's just going to burn. So don't worry about it. Loving your life in this world is the surest way to lose it. In John 12, 25, he who loves his life will do what? Lose it. You love the world, you love the things of the world. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to lose it. 1981. A photographer set out on a grand expedition to Alaska. He was prepared. He brought heavy artillery, guns, ammunition. He brought 500 rolls of film. This was before digital, guys. 500 rolls. 1,400 pounds of food and supplies. He was prepared for this life. But about August came along and he was recording in his diary... I wonder if I made plans for getting out of here. His diary became desperation. 
And in November of 1981, 226 miles northeast of Fairbanks, he died in an unnamed valley next to an unnamed lake. He prepared for this life. What did he not prepare for? The exit. He had never prepared. And you think, how dumb. But isn't that what life is all about? My friend Skip, I'm quoting him today because he's here. He says, you got to prepare for heaven because it's a gated community. <laughs> you got to have reservations. And you got to have a reservation in heaven. You can't just enjoy this life and think, well, I'll make it because I, I'm doing so much good here on earth or I'm having too much fun or I'll wait to the last minute. It doesn't work. I mean, I know some people I've shared the gospel with, and they say, well, I, I, I've got too much in this life to enjoy. I write down what I, I need to do, and if I see I'm going to die, I'll make a decision. One of the men working for me was a chief warrant officer. This back in my military days. He says, Captain... Not ready for this. Write it down. So I did. About three years after I left the service, I was at Dallas Seminary, and I received a letter from him. And he says, Ron, he says, I just want you to know I made a decision to follow the Lord. I went, wow, neat. He says, I did it just before I had triple bypass surgery. <laughs> it worked. And he was growing in the Lord. I knew another example. It was another navigator who shared the gospel with this guy. And he was a pilot. He's a wild weasel. Some of you military guys know what a wild weasel is. They go up there and they, they attract the enemy artil uh, you know, missiles, get shot at. And then while they're being shot at, the others come in and blow up the missiles behind them. Well, he was a wild weasel. And he said, I, I've got too much party and too much to do. Write it down if I ever have to. Well, he was flying a mission, and his engine quit. And he, was he tried to eject. He couldn't eject, and he knew he was going to die. And he remembered that little thing in his pocket, and he grabbed it and took it out and prayed. And his engine started back up. And he says, oh, no! You got to make plans. You got to have your reservations. What does it mean to hate your life? What does hating your life look like? Does that mean we all have to become monks, grow long hair, wear these long gowns, and sing John Richard's favorite Gregorian chants? Is, is that what we do? I mean, that's what it means to hate life. <laughs> no, that's not what it's talking about. To hate our lives is the same as denying ourselves. It's the exact same thing. It, it's focusing on others and the lives of others and, and not ourselves. It's not saying we can't enjoy the pleasures of this life. If God blesses us with things, that's wonderful. Enjoy them and give God thanks. But that's not the purpose. We don't live for those things. Instead, we deny ourselves. And then we follow Him. We need to follow Him. What does it mean to follow Him? Go where He goes, do what He does. Live like he lives. Eat what he eats. Where did he go? To the world. What did he do? Share the good news. Uh, what did he eat? Uh, whatever the people around him ate. 
I mean, that's our responsibility to follow him. Here's the tough part. Brace yourself. He went to the cross. Are we willing to follow him to the cross? It also means to bear much fruit. You know, John 15, 8, it says, so shall, be, so shall ye be my disciples if you bear much fruit. If we follow Jesus, you know what our purpose, our goal should be? To be fruit bearers. Lots and lots of fruit. Now, I, I understand that a great part of that is character. Our, our character needs to reflect the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, meekness, gentleness, goodness. We need to be bearing that. But it, it's not just the character, because if you have character, it means you're going to do something about it, which means sharing the gospel with others, discipling others. It, it means letting your life shine through the life of others. Do we bear much fruit if we're following Jesus? Now, immediately in our materialistic society, you know what next question we ask? What do I get out of it? You follow Jesus, what are you going to get? You get to be with him. You remember what he says again a little bit later in, in John, John 14? I go prepare a place for you. So guess what we get? We get to be with Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? It doesn't mean in this life we're going to have it easy. Y'all understand that. It, it doesn't say that. But eventually we're going to be with Jesus. I think that's going to be glorious myself. I look forward to it. I'm not trying to rush it, by the way. But shouldn't we be striving to be with Jesus every day, every hour? We need to serve him. We need to serve him. What does it mean to serve? What's our service? It's being a servant to God. What's a servant to God? One who does what God says. We come and say, your wish is my command. Whatever you want me to do. That, that involves the word of God. And we don't get to ignore it. If he says, do this, we do it. That's what a true servant is. And if he says, don't do it, we don't because we're servants. But I like doing that. I want to do that. And you said not. Hmm. That's a struggle we all have. But what we need to do is serve our Father. And, and if you serve fa the Father, you know what you're also serving? Who you're also serving? You're serving Jesus. Remember the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They are how many gods? One God. You serve the Father, you're serving the Son, you're serving the Spirit. And what should be our motivation? Our motivation is because he wants us to. I love him. And because I love him, I want to serve him with everything I have and all that I am. So in this passage, it begins with the truth about himself. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And this will be happening when a grain of wheat falls on the ground and dies. Then he makes the truth about himself a truth about us. Will we hate our lives in this world? Will we follow him to the path of Calvary? Will we serve the Son? Will we let, will we let the truth about the Son of Man become truth about us? Will we identify 
with the one who is so eager to die for us.